It's uh, time to preach, and I want you to listen real careful. Everybody, pay attention. All the young people, mamas, babies. Got a message this morning that the Lord dealt with my heart about. It's for you who are, are saved, and you know you're saved, but you find yourself living in a wicked, wicked, wicked world. And sometimes it's hard to reconcile being a, being saved and seeing how things are in this world and especially even how we live ourselves and disappoint ourselves and disappoint God. Look in Lamentations chapter 5. This book only has five chapters in it. The first chapter has 22 verses. The second chapter has 22 verses. The fourth chapter has 22 verses. The fifth chapter has 22 verses. The middle chapter has 66 verses. Don't ask me what in the world that represents. But I know God don't do nothing by mistake. And uh, even the chapter and verses in the Bible are inspired of God. And it's there for definite reasons. Lamentation. What does that word sound like? Lament. It means like crying, you're sorry. You're in remorse. Look at verse number 15. The joy of our heart is ceased. Our dance is turned in the morning. The crown is fallen from our head. Woe unto us that we have sinned. For this our heart is faint. For these things our eyes are dim. Because of the mountain of Zion, which is desolate, the foxes walk upon it. Thou, O Lord, remainest forever. Thy throne from generation to generation. Wherefore dost thou forget us forever and forsake us so long time? Turn thou unto us, us unto thee, O Lord and we shall be turned. Renew our days as of old. But thou hast utterly rejected us. Thou art very wroth against us. There's several verses that I want to point out something to you here this morning. Look at them with me again. Up there in verse number 16, the last part of it, it says, We have sinned. Verse 17 tells you the result. What happens when we sin? Our heart is faint. Listen carefully now. We need it real quiet. For these things our eyes are dim. Foxes walk on the mountains. Sin dims your eyes, hardens your heart, and lets the foxes of sin come and walk on your mountaintops. I want to preach to you this morning on this subject. What to do when you have sinned? What to do when you have sinned? I'll guarantee you this morning that there's somebody sitting in this congregation that recently, I'm not talking about five years ago, I'm not talking about ten years ago, I'm talking about recently, within the last month, two months, three months, you've committed a terrible sin. And you got saved and you loved the Lord and you went to church and you got in church every time the doors was open and you thought your life had been cleaned up. You thought that everything was alright and really in your heart you thought you would never, ever, ever do nothing like that again. And you really meant not to. And you thought, I, you say, I would have never dreamed that I would have ever stooped so low as to do what I did the other day, or last week, or last month. There may be somebody in here this morning that's just as saved as anybody's ever been, but your life has fallen to an all-time low in the last few weeks or months. And listen, listen, the devil is hitting people this morning like I've never seen him hit people before. Christian people. Christian people are being slapped in the face with right out open, blatant sin. And Christian people are messing up all around. 
We'll be kidding ourselves this morning if we looked at our choir and our preacher and our members and our Sunday school classes and think, boy, nobody in our church had ever done nothing wrong. Listen, this world is full of sin. I'll guarantee you, there's somebody in this room this morning, you've sinned. I mean you've sinned bad. I'm not talking about everyday sins like, oh no, I shouldn't have thought that, or oh no, I shouldn't have said that, and God forgive me. I'm talking about doing something that you know is wicked and against the will of God. You've sinned. I'm going to tell you what to do. I'm going to tell you four things that you need to do this morning, and if you'll listen to these four things, it very well may change the course of your life from this moment on. Number one, do not panic. Do not panic. You know why I say that? Because after dealing with people over the past 12 years and talking with hundreds of people on the streets and in my office and different places, I've noticed that when a person sins, the devil tempts you, he puts something out in front of you, you go for the bait, you bite it, you sin. That is only the beginning. Lots of times we think, well, the devil's been tempting me with this thing for a long time, whatever it might be. And the devil's put it over here and it looks desirable. Well, I finally gave in the other day. That seems like the end, but it's only the beginning. And the reason I say it's only the beginning is because many Christians, and you may not understand what I'm getting ready to say, but many Christians suffer more from the repercussions after the sin and the, the waves that come in after the sin is committed than they do the actual sin itself. And the reason I say that is because a Christian has a conscience. And a Christian has the Holy Spirit living inside of them. And many times after you've committed that sin, you are really in for it then because of all the problems that it brings in down on your head. I mean, it tears everything up when you sin. It tears your home life up. It tears your church life up. You don't feel right on your job. You don't feel right reading the Bible. You don't feel right praying. You don't feel right sitting in church. And you don't feel right staying at home. It rocks the whole boat of your life when you sin against God. It's like this. The devil says, Boy, wouldn't you like to do this? You say, No, devil, that's wrong. And the next day the devil says, Boy, don't you think you ought to try this? No, devil, that's wrong. The devil says, Looky here. Everybody else is doing it. Looky here. So and so's doing it. So looky there. So and so's doing it. They claim you owe it to yourself. Have a little fun. Try. Come on. It's all right. My goodness. One time won't hurt. Just an experiment. And little by little by little you begin to listen to him. And that thing starts looking better and better and better. It might be a beer can. It might be a joint, it might be a pill, it might be a party, it might be a girl, it might be a boy, but it looks better and better and better and better and better. And the first thing you know, you're flirting with that temptation. If you're admiring it, you're looking at it. And that's when you start getting in trouble. And the next thing you know, temporarily you forget about everything. You forget about God, you forget about the church, you forget about... You are, first thing you know, you find yourself sinning against God. And brother, as soon as that sin is complete, it may be adultery, it may be uh, some kind of unfaithfulness to your husband or your wife, it, as soon as that sin is complete, your heart just does one of these things and something begins to twist you inside and then that same lying devil that told you it was alright, that same lying devil that told you there wasn't nothing wrong with it, that same lying devil that told you it was okay will jump on your case and say, boy, some Christian you are. Look what you've done. And beat you down and beat you down and beat you down. And many times will do you more damage after the sin is committed than the sin itself did. That's when you'll panic. That's when you'll panic. I've seen many people right then flip out, brother. I've seen them go nuts. I've seen them say, I, I can't go back to church. Look what I've done. Oh no. Oh no. I've committed adultery. I've got drunk. I've, I've stole some. I've, I've done. Oh no. I can't go back to church, brother Danny. I resigned my Sunday school class. I resigned my, my bus route. I, resigned, I just quit everything. That's the wrong thing to do. 
Don't panic. Listen, two wrongs don't make a right. And the first thing the devil will do to you when you sin is jump on your case and say, Well, you can't go to church now. Look what a hypocrite you are. Now let me stop and explain something right here. I may not even get to all four things that I want to tell you, but this is real important. Y'all listen to me. A hypocrite is somebody who claims to be something and deliberately lives another life but puts on a foot like everything's alright while we're at church. That's a hypocrite. A man that falls and said, Oh God, I'm sorry, I'm a low down good for nothing bum. God have mercy on me. And come to church and said, Y'all pray for me, I'm a low down backslid, no good. Listen, listen, that ain't a hypocrite. I don't care if you fell down 50 times this week, if you got up by the grace of God and got it right with God and got up here and do your best, you ain't a hypocrite. A hypocrite is a man who deliberately sins. He has no intentions of quitting. He's satisfied with his lifestyle. It don't even bother him to put on a front. That is a man that's in bad shape. I ain't talking about them kind of people this morning. I'm talking about you that really love God. You say, oh, Brother Danny, you think somebody really loves God could do one of those bad things? Are you kidding? I know they can. I've seen it. I've seen some of the strongest Christians that I knew down through the years commit some of the worst sins. You know what? They ain't nobody above it. And if you ever get to thinking, boy, I'd never do nothing like that, you better watch out, friend. The devil's got a trap set for you. The Bible said, let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. You see, everything gets messed up when you sin. Your mind will drive you crazy. The devil will say, What would so and so think if they knew this? Then you get paranoid. And every, when you walk in the room, you think, They're talking about me. Everybody at the church knows how I am. Then the devil will heap more guilt and more guilt and more guilt. I've had people tell me over and over and over and over and over. I'd give anything in the world if I hadn't have done that. But listen, friend, you're in trouble this morning. But don't panic. Don't panic. Just stay calm for a minute and let me talk to you. The joy of your heart is ceased. When Tim was singing about the midnight cry a while ago and Jesus coming again, you were sitting there saying, I wish I could feel good like them boys up there and raise their hand and praise God. The joy of my heart is ceased. And you know what the devil will tell you? The devil will tell you that since you've sinned and since you've committed that wickedness, that you can ever, 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 ever feel that way again. Don't panic. Don't panic. Number two, you've got to accept responsibility. You have got to accept responsibility. You can't run from it. You can't dodge it like a rabbit. You can't take off and move to Florida. You can't take off and, and take off to Hickory or Asheville and say, I, I just want to get away from Mary and I just want to get... Listen, lots of times, lots of times, I've seen people try to run from sin. But you can't do it. You take it with you. It's right inside your heart. You can't run from a guilty conscience. How many of you have ever... Just, you know, people gossiped about you. and I, You ever said, I'm going to leave MacDowell County and never see this place again. How many ever thought that? Raise your hand. Well, I want to tell you something, friend. When you leave MacDowell County, as much as you hate it, you're taking part of it with you. That's you. <laughs> and you ain't going to get away from you. The only way you can get away from you is die. You want to do that? Kill yourself. That'd be wrong. You can't do that. And so, you've got to accept your responsibility. You've got to keep your cool. You've got to not panic. And you've got to say, I have done wrong. Now, I am going to have to deal with it. Now, you, you know what a lot of people do? When they sin, they panic and say, oh no, oh no. And I'll be, if they don't, instead of getting that sin straight and getting their life straightened out, they'll commit their worst sin, panicking over that first sin. You ever see anybody do that? Now, I'm relating to some of you. Some of you are looking at me like you're angels. But there's about 80 heads in here going just like this. So I'll preach to them 80 this morning. And you perfect people pray for the rest of us sinners. We're having a hard time with it. You've got to accept responsibility. Let me give you an example. 
Here's a young boy, first time he ever broke into any place. He's in the store stealing some candy. And he, he took a, a knife and he got in the door with it and he stole some candy. But while he's in the store, the policeman comes. And, and before he realizes it, he panics and stabs the policeman. Now he's got a murder charge against him. If he had just stuck out his hand and said, Okay, I've done wrong. I accept my responsibility. Went to jail. Acted like a gentleman. Come before the judge and said, Judge, I was wrong. I wasn't thinking right. There's a real good chance he would have been pardoned or just put on probation and got off with a very light sentence. But instead, he panicked. He took the knife. He stabbed the policeman. Now he's not only facing breaking and entering. Now he's facing a murder charge. And he'll pay for it the rest of his life. I'm saying, don't commit one another sin, trying to get out of that first sin. Don't commit. Don't just get out and go crazy. You say, well, I've done messed up now. The devil will think, tell you just because you messed up. I as well just go out completely and blow your whole life. It's not true. Accept your responsibility. It seems like that it may last forever. You know what that verse said? How long will you forsake us, God? It's been so long since I felt your presence, God. It's been so long. you got to accept your responsibility. You sin, you got to accept the consequences. And your consequences will be much lighter if you'll own up to what you've done, confess it to God. I don't say you have to get up here in front of the church and tell. Ours has never been a church where we made people get up and tell everybody what they've done. It ain't going to do no good for you to come down here and tell me what you've done wrong. I, it wouldn't, I couldn't forgive you. I don't even want to hear it. You confess to who you sinned against. When you sin against God, you confess to God. If there's another person involved, confess to that person also. Don't go grabbing it all over creation. The devil will make you think you have. The devil will say, you've got to get up in front of the whole church and tell me. Just keep your mouth shut. Nobody won't think nothing. <laughs> now, if they all know it, you're supposed to confess, right? Are y'all listening to me this morning? I, what if I got up here and told you everything I'd ever done wrong? Would you want to hear it? You wouldn't want to hear me preach no more. <coughs> Brother Danny, I'd hate to know what you have done. I wouldn't, I'd, I'd grab my young'uns and get out of here probably. <laughs> hey, you confess it to God and whoever you sinned against. If I sin against Brother John... I'm not going to get up here and say, boys, I've done Brother John terrible this week. I'm going to go to Brother John and say, Brother John, I'm sorry. I want it right with you. And I confess it to God and Him. Accept your responsibility. You know what this guy told me? I talked to a guy recently. And this man's saved, I believe, as I am. He's rebelled against God. He's left his wife. He's in trouble. He's living like a devil. And he told me, he said, why didn't God do something about my situation? And he's telling me about a certain sin that he couldn't get the victory over. And I said, what you talking about, man? He said, why didn't God help me to get over it? And I said, are you blaming God? He said, well, I tried as hard as I could. If he ever had a chance to prove his power, he had it with me. Why didn't he help me? I said, what you talking about, man? Are you honestly telling me it's God's fault for the mess you're in? He said, well, I try. he said, I tried my best. I read, I prayed, I fasted, I done, and nothing didn't change. Why didn't God do something? Listen, that guy is not accepting his responsibility. You cannot blame God for what happened to you. What is that? Somebody else told me recently. They said, I pray, I read, I pray, I read, nothing don't happen. I ask God for something, and He don't give it to me. You know what you're doing? You're trying to get out of that thing and say, well, it's God's fault I'm living like this. If he hadn't let this happen, good. You know where you start backsliding? is when you get mad at the Lord. Well, God, why'd you let this happen? It don't seem fair. You might not say it, but you think it. And this guy I talked to on the phone, he said, I'm paying a psychiatrist $100 an hour to counsel me. I said, that's stupid. You probably know what your problem is more than he does. You probably know more than he does. He said, yeah, that's true. He said, my IQ is higher than his. And I said, you're paying him $100 an hour? I'll tell you for nothing what's wrong. Get right with the Lord. But he don't want to hear that. You know why people go to psychiatrists? Ease their conscience. Not always. 
Many, many times. Psychiatrists make a living off people dumping their burdens on them and tell them it's not their fault for how wicked they are. Amen? That's how they make a living. You know what my job is? My job is to tell you the complete opposite. It is your fault. You can't blame your mama. You can't blame your daddy. You can't blame your brother. You can't blame your sister. And you sure can't blame God. And you can't blame the church. A lot of people say, well, I believe the church has failed. What's, uh, I, I just don't get anything out of it. You can't point your finger at your Sunday school teacher. You can't point your finger at a revival preacher. You can't point your finger at nobody on this earth and say, that's all I've sinned. You've got to accept your responsibility. Until you do... You're not going to get help from God. Number three. You listening now? Confess it to God. Confe you say, preacher, he already knows it. I know it, but he wants you to confess it. Turn your Bible to 1 John chapter 1. I usually don't do this on Sunday morning, having you turn to Scriptures and stuff for time's sake. But I want you to look at this. This is one of the greatest verses in the Bible. One of my favorite verses, thank God for 1 John 1 9. If I had a dollar for every time I'd claim 1 John 1 9, I'd be a rich man. I thank God for 1 John 1 9. If you don't ever need it, bless your soul. More power to you. But I thank God for 1 John 1 9. Oh, what a wonderful blessing. It's written to save people, Christian people. Look what it said in verse number 9. If we, who's that? Save people, right? That ain't talking about lost people. If we confess our sins, He is what, folks? Faithful. Amen. Say it again. Faithful. He is faithful. He is faithful. You say, well, Brother Daniel, well, I've done the same thing ten times. That didn't say if we confess our sins, He's faithful in just the first ten, but not the eleventh. It said He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Bible says if you confess it to God, that God in heaven guarantees absolute promises that He'll cleanse you and make you white just like a clean piece of white cloth hang you out and say that person is clean in my sight. Listen, I could never, ever, ever get up here and preach if I didn't believe that verse. Oh, my conscience would bother me because of my sins. Things that I've done that I shouldn't have done. Things that I shouldn't have done that I, that I, that I did do. And things that I didn't do that I should do would aggravate me to death if I didn't believe that God said, I'll forgive you if you'll ask and confess it. Now, I know what your problem is. You're trying to pay God for your sin. You're trying to, just like people try to work their way to heaven, you're trying to buy His forgiveness. I'll tell you how I know that. Have you ever noticed that right after you really commit a terrible sin, you want to get real dedicated? Oh boy, I'm going to start reading my Bible, Lord. God, I'm going to fast today. God, I'm going to do that. You know what you're trying to do? You're trying to impress Him. And you're saying, He'll see how serious I am and He'll forgive me. That's an insult to God Almighty. The price for every sin me and you've ever committed was paid for by Jesus Christ on the cross. You do not work to earn God Almighty's forgiveness. You accept God's forgiveness. Now it's alright to fast and pray and read the Bible and that's wonderful. And you ought to do that. But not to obtain forgiveness, brother. Not, you don't get forgiveness by crying. People say, oh boy, I'll go to and I'll cry and I'll bawl and God will forgive me. You don't get forgiven by crying. You get forgiven by something. What he did on Calvary. That blood of Jesus Christ was good enough to save you to begin with. It's good enough to help you be, stay clean the rest of your life. It's just like a vacuum cleaner. The Bible said if we walk in the light, as He's in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, just follows you around. And such those sin, every time you commit one, it cleanses you from all sin. He keeps you clean. You know what? Just because you take a shower one time, don't mean you'll never need another one. You'll need another one tomorrow. I'll need one by this time next week if I, if I sweat a whole lot. But I'm telling you what, brother, listen, hey, you need another one. 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 Now, when a baby's born, it's clean. It don't look it, but it's clean. And brother, it gets dirty and you get it washed and washed and washed and you keep scrubbing on that little 
thing until it's able to scrub itself. Now when God saves you, you don't get born but one time. You don't get born again but one time. You need a bunch of baths though after that. How many of you believe you ought to take a bath every day? I noticed the ones that didn't raise their hand, there's nobody sitting with around you. But I believe you ought to take a spiritual bath every day. I believe you ought to confess your sins to God every day of your life and ask God to cleanse you. And with me, with me, that's not just a belief. It's something that I feel like I've got to do. Listen to me. Did you know... I don't see how people can go days and days without reading their Bible and talking to the Lord. Let me say this. Y'all help me with these babies. Will you help me just a little bit? I need it real quiet in here. Now, please help me. Do you know what a lot of people do? They'll commit a sin. And right then... That was Russia or somebody. The demons don't want you to hear what I'm getting ready to say. Help me now, mamas. Please now. I want everybody to hear this. Do you know what the devil will do? The devil, as soon as you commit that sin, he'll make you think, well, you can't talk to God. You can't pray. And He'll make you wait two or three days before you try to pray about that thing. That's a dumb thing to do. Somehow or another we got it in our mind that it'll kind of wire off in a few days and then God won't be so mad at us. Brother, the time to... Com- Listen, you ought to be confessing that thing immediately. As soon as you know you sin, as soon as you say, Oh God, what have I done? Get down and say, Dear God, I'm sorry. Right then! Don't give it a chance to stay in your heart. It's just like an old dirty cancer. Confess it to God. Turn to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. And in Hebrews chapter 9, look at verse number 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ... This is real important, especially since we're going to have the Lord's Supper tonight. That you know you're forgiven and right with God. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, purge your what? Your what? What? Your conscience. That's what some of you need to get purged this morning. Your conscience. The blood of Jesus Christ will relieve you of having a guilty conscience. Other, you know why a lot of people go get drunk? Because their conscience is driving them crazy because of what they've done. You know why a lot of... I know, I know families that are not in church this morning, and you do too. Because one of the people in the, in the family sinned. They were never able to deal with the guilt. They were never able to deal with all the emotional turmoil and and trauma that comes from a sin. And it upsets their whole life. And they're out of church this morning when they could have confessed it to God and accepted His forgiveness, believed it, and then went on with a clear conscience. That's what you've got to do. Y'all hear me? That's what you've got to do. Are you listening to me? That's what you've got to do. The devil will say, well, it's not fair, see. You can't just ask forgiveness and go on. No, sir, buddy. You're going to pay for your sin. Just tell him to shut up and leave you alone. You've sinned. You've accepted it. You've asked God to forgive you. Trust what the blood of Jesus done for you on the cross and forget that thing. You know what I believe? I believe it's wrong to keep confessing the same sin over and over and over and over and over and over to God when He's already forgiven you and washed you in the blood and the devil just tormenting you to keep you from amounting to anything for the glory of God. Some of you could be singing in the choir this morning, but you won't because of something you've done a long time ago. Why don't you say, I believe the blood was shed for me? I don't care what the devil says. I don't care. You claim to believe the King James Bible? That's in the King James Bible, the blood of Jesus Christ.
and there was a sin had gotten in my life and it's bothering me. And I said, oh Lord, how could I do that and me be a Christian? And I was so discouraged. And I prayed. I thought, I thought you kind of had to talk God into forgiving you. And I'd get down on the floor and I'd beat my head on the floor in the basement. And I'd say, oh God, I'm sorry, God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, God, I mean it, God, I don't ever do it. And I thought, well, I'll feel something now when He forgives me. Have you ever tried that? You're looking for a feeling. You think, now when the forgiveness comes, I'll feel it. And I was sitting there in that camp meeting and I was feeling guilty. Everybody shout, I couldn't shout. People would stand up and say, Whoa! I'd say, oh, good night, I'd love to be clean that old sorry sin. The sin's got me down. I'll be a hypocrite if I shout. And the preacher got up and he started preaching. And he come across this thing of forgiveness. And he said, some of you people out there... You've asked God to forgive you three and four times for the very same thing. What is the matter with you? You calling God a liar? And buddy, that thing hit me right between the eyes, and I said, "My soul, that's what I'm doing." It's just like a light turned on in my heart. I said, "Here, I've been beating my head on the floor. I've been agonizing. I've been begging God to forgive me." And the Word said, "If I confessed it, He had forgiven it." And I said, "Lord, see what it is you think." Well, it wouldn't be right for me to enjoy myself after I've seen like I have. You're right. It ain't fair. It ain't fair. Salvation ain't fair. We don't deserve it. Jesus paid the price for us. We don't deserve it. It's not fair on our part. Neither is forgiveness. Don't that just let you know how good God is? God is good, folks. God is good. God is good. I like to jump over this pulpit this morning. And while I'm flying through the air, back through there, headed to that back wall, say, God is good. God is good. God will forgive you this morning. You're sitting there saying, Brother Danny, them good sounding words. But will it work for me? Yes, it'll work for you. You say, well, Brother Preacher, you don't know what I've done. I've been out here running around with my husband and nobody knows it. And I feel like if I don't talk to somebody, I'm going to die. I'll tell you who to talk to. Talk to the Lord. Talk to the Lord. You can get forgiveness. You can get forgiveness. The last thing I'll say this morning is go on with your life. You say, well, preacher, I've done something terrible. Shouldn't, it, shouldn't I just quit my Sunday school class and quit singing in the choir and just sit back here for about six months? If you'll show me that in the Bible. You say, shouldn't I put myself on probation? I'll tell you what let's do. Let's let God settle the matter. What did the Lord say? You say, preacher, can God ever use me again? Well, what does the Bible say? Did He use David? David had a man killed to get his wife. And I mean, that's awful, folks. That's rotten. That's, that's a wicked thing to do. And I'm not condoning it. You know that. But God forgave him. And he confessed in Psalm 51 and said, Lord, make me clean. God did make him clean and God used him. Peter, the apostle Peter, was out cussing, saying he didn't even know God. You know, we have the idea that once a person's messed up, they can never be of service to it at all. That's abomination. That ain't right. That ain't right. That ain't in the Bible. Peter was out there cussing, man. Next thing you know, he's over in Acts chapter 2 preaching and 3,000 people got saved. You know what? You quit worrying about your kin, folks. You quit worrying about what some of your cousins told you. You quit worrying. About Somebody said, oh, you're a hypocrite. You can't go to church or living like that. You can't go to church or living like that. Listen, brother. This is where you need to be. Confessing that thing and getting it right with God. Have you sinned? You say, well, Brother Danny, I can't go to the altar after you preach that because people are liable to think I've done something terrible. That's another thing you're going to have to get over. Quit worrying about what people think. I'd think something. I'd think awful of you if you don't ask forgiveness. So let's get it settled between you and the Lord this morning. Let's stand by our heads. I preached to you this morning on what to do if you've sinned. You know what to do. You pick the axe back up. You start chopping the tree again. That's what you do. You don't even miss a lick. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Christians are praying. Is God speaking to your heart this morning?
is he? There's something somebody's been troubled with for a long time here this morning. And you're going to have to get forgiveness. You ain't never going to be no count to God or nobody until you accept His forgiveness. You say, well, Brother Danny, that just sounds too easy. Now there you go trying to complicate it again. Jesus Christ shed His blood for you on the cross. Now you've got to accept it. You say, well, it don't seem fair. It ain't. But thank God it's true. Now the Lord can help you this morning. Somebody needs to come to this altar. Dear God in heaven, help my brother my sister here this morning who's struggling with a terrible, terrible, guilty conscience. They feel so ungodly. They feel so dirty inside. God help them to come and claim forgiveness. They can't work for it. They can't wait six months and it'll go away. God, they got to have forgiveness through the blood. Restore them to where they ought to be this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Some have already come this morning. If God's speaking to your heart while we sing the first verse of this song, come on, just get out of your seat and come right now. Let's pray. Let's sing. Come on. Let's pray the last time. Will you come? Will you come right now? Come on, just get out of your seat. Amen. Amen. Come on. Don't be ashamed. Don't you be ashamed this morning. Let's settle it before God. Let's settle it between you and the Lord this morning. I'll tell you not to be a hypocrite. Confess it to God. I don't care how many times you've messed up. Just get it right. Get it right. Get it right. There's hope for you, friend. There's hope for you. God can bless you. God can forgive you. The Lord knows to. Listen, we, I've never seen a time in my life when Christians are so hurt and discouraged and, and they, they fail and they think, Oh, no, there's no hope for me. I'm here to tell you there are. There are hope for you. The blood never lost its power. God will forgive you this morning if you'll come. Let's come and lay on this altar once and for all and get it over with, will you? Why are we saying? Why are we saying? Won't you come right now? Come on. Just Amen. As I am Amen. And waiting on come on. Come on. Be a man. Be a woman. Let's get this time before God. Why are you forgiving? Why are you cleansing? Get up. Go on and live your life. Some still coming, some still coming. Let's sing one more verse. Amen. Amen. Come on, come on. Let God help you this morning. You need to come. Just come on. Just get out of your seat and come. Don't be ashamed. This is your chance. This is your opportunity. Will you come right now? Amen. Amen. Let the Lord help you this morning. Just get out of your seat and come on to Jesus. Would you bow your heads with me just a moment? I want to pray with these on the altar this morning. You folks at the altar, just stay right where you are just a minute. And everybody bow your head back here and you pray. There might be somebody standing back there this morning and say, Preacher, I didn't come to the altar this morning, but I sure needed what you preached on. And I sure needed. The devil has tried his best to get the victory over me. And by God's grace, I ain't going to let him do it. I'm going to pick up my hack, axe. I'm going to pick up my handle. And I'm going to go on hoeing for the glory of God. I want you to pray for me. Would you raise your hand anywhere? All right. God bless you. Now, you folks just stay at the altar here this morning. I'm going to pray with you. That Bible that you got in your hand and you got laying back there, it says, if there's a word of truth in that Bible, it says if you confess it, that you're forgiven. 
Now you've got to believe God this morning. You have got to believe what He says. If you don't believe what He says, the devil will keep tormenting you and tormenting you and your conscience and your past or your friends or your family. People keep aggravating you. The devil, listen, get it far here. Don't die this morning and go back to your seat carrying that same old load. Don't listen to the devil. He's a liar. He's a liar from the beginning. He abode not in the truth. He can't tell the truth. If you confess it to God, you're forgiven right now. He's a liar. Dear God, I pray for these on the altar and that have been on the altar this morning. Lord, we're needy creatures. God, we're a bunch of low-down sinners. They ain't none of us fit for nothing except what you've done for us. Oh, God, help us, Lord, this morning to accept your forgiveness. We sure don't deserve it, but we welcome it and we thank you for it. Now, these on the altar, I pray they be cleansed. I pray they be washed in the blood of the Lamb. And Lord, just like they accepted by faith that you saved them, let them accept by faith now that you've forgiven them. And God, let them get up clean and never, ever, 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 ever confess that sin again. It's gone forever and ever. Help them to get that victory and know it. Lord, help them to just stand on it. In Jesus' name we pray and for Jesus' sake. Amen.